Uh, I want to thank um, uh, Pamela Rosenberg and uh, Linda Reich for uh, this wonderful opportunity to, uh, to be here in this very musical city. And uh, just to say, I think, you know, the work that uh, you guys are, are doing is really marvelous in terms of uh, musical education. So um, I hope that we can contribute here. And what I would like to do today is um, I'm not an educator and I'm not a, de a developmental psychologist, I'm a neuroscientist. So what I want to do is to try to give you some kind of um, background or uh, basis perhaps drawn from science so that uh, you can better understand what, um, what the properties are of the brain that allow us to have music and perhaps based on that you will be able to um, have a, a deeper understanding of how music works. And from my perspective, what I always say is that as a scientist, the reason that uh, we are very interested in music is because music also helps us understand how the brain works. So um, I want to um, suggest to you that from uh, the point of view of neuroscience, um, music is something that not only uh, makes use of a great deal of the, the most advanced uh, circuitry of the brain, um, but also that it's a completely normal and natural kind of activity. And um, perhaps uh, Professor Fitch, uh, who is uh, going to appear later on, may speak more about this, but some of the evidence that we have about how uh, music fits in to um, human society comes from archeology. span So um, recently, these uh, very, very ancient flutes were discovered in um, the Danube Valley. So it's actually what is now Germany. And um, these flutes date back to the upper Paleolithic period when portions of Europe were still under uh, glaciation. And it's remarkable that people who lived at that time, who presumably were barely uh, able to survive based on um, the very harsh environment and their lack of uh, general technology, nevertheless spent a lot of time and effort to create these remarkable flutes. Oh, there's something there that we don't need. Um, I don't know if you can see it there, but uh, these are very, very finely uh, made flutes. The, the size of the holes is very carefully um, machined, well, I guess, uh, um, created so that they fit the, the fingers, and also the distances between the holes correspond roughly to what we today would call a diatonic scale. So presumably, in order for these people to make this instrument, music must have been extremely important for them, and also music must have already existed well before they were able to make flutes, presumably on the basis of the singing voice. So music is really um, with us as a species, I would suggest, from the very beginning which raises the question of why it's even there. And Darwin pondered this question, and when he, uh, his most famous uh, quote about music from the, the Descent of Man is the following, where he says, as neither the enjoyment nor the capacity of producing music are faculties of any direct use, they must be ranked amongst the most mysterious with which humans are endowed. So he basically did not have any idea what music could be for. He just said, it's mysterious, we don't know. But 10 years later, he was reflecting in his own autobiography um, about his um, uh, aging process and how he actually had a lot of difficulty with music late in life. And he said the following, if I had to live my life again, I would have made it a rule to read some poetry and listen to some music at least once every week, for perhaps the parts of my brain now atrophied would thus have been kept active through use. Which is really a remarkable statement, right? And then he goes on to say, that the loss of these tastes is a loss of happiness and may possibly be injurious to the intellect and to the moral character by enfeebling the emotional part of our nature. And I think in this statement, Darwin actually answered the question that he had posed 10 years earlier. Maybe he didn't quite realize it. But this is, I think, uh, he's getting to the crux of the matter here. This is why music is so important, is because it allows us to um, capture something about our emotions and about um, the, what he calls the, the uh, moral character.
So I want to defend the proposition, um, several propositions really, that um, music is really part of what makes us human. It's part of our original mental machinery. And music is abstract, but I would argue that it is both unique and universal to the human species, and that it represents a way for us to communicate and to regulate emotional arousal and to create pleasure. And the reason why we can do this is because we have the right hardware. If we didn't have the brain that we have, we would not have music. So I think we have specialized brains that allow us to create music, and it's a species-typical and species-specific behavior, just like, let's say, echolocation is a species-specific behavior for a bat. We have music. Bats have to capture insects when they fly. That's how they survive. We need to communicate and regulate our emotions. That's how we survive. Um, at the same time, this, this system or this hardware can be refined by training. So even though everyone has this capacity, with specific kinds of training and exposure, um, the system can be refined. And in this sense, it's a lot like walking. Walking is perfectly natural. Every child will walk without needing any special training. But you can then uh, become an Olympic runner, or you can become a trapeze artist who walks on the wire, or you can become a ballet dancer. So those require very special training. But it's based upon a fundamental um, ability that we all have. So turning then to the brain, we can look at some of the uh, circuitry that's involved. And this is something that we've been doing in our laboratory for maybe 30 years or so, trying to understand some of the different um, components, the brain structures and the brain functions that are relevant for both um, hearing, perceiving, understanding music, and producing music. And I won't have time to give you the entire uh, anatomy lesson. I'm not sure if you can see that here, but um, the areas of the brain that I want to call your attention to are here in the temporal cortex. This is where the auditory uh, areas are. And then these arrows represent different pathways where sound information gets uh, sent to. And there's one that goes towards the front. That's known as the anteroventral pathway. And there's one that goes towards the back. It's known as the posterior dorsal pathway. And these pathways have different functions. And I won't bore you with a lot of details about it. But um, I will give you some evidence about the different functionality of these regions. And if we start on the auditory cortex, which is uh, this area shown in green here, some of the earliest evidence we have for the importance of the um, temporal lobe, which is what's shown in red here, um, in res uh, with regard to music, comes from the founder of the institute where I work, so Wilder Penfield, who was a neurosurgeon who was working in the 1940s and 50s, um, in 1963 published this paper where he showed that if you stimulate the uh, exposed cortex, which you can see on the top right, once in a while the patient will um, experience a musical hallucination. So if you pass a current, very small current, on the surface of the cortex, uh, the patient will say that they hear something and that it sounds very much like music. And the locations where this tends to happen, as shown by the red dots, is in the auditory uh, area. And so this indicates that um, there must be stored representations of music that we all carry around with us and that if you are unlucky enough to have brain surgery and the surgeon puts a, an electrode and passes a current, this representation that you have there can immediately be called, uh, called up to the point where it, it is um, actually perceivable. So you actually hear something like music. Now we can zoom forward about uh, 50 years to very recent studies that we've carried out uh, in our laboratory. And we can, um, using brain imaging uh, techniques, we can probe the brain's uh, activity patterns without having to open up the skull or stick electrodes in, which is very convenient. Um, and in, in one study that we published recently, one of my um, uh, uh, PhD students, uh, Michael Klein, did an experiment where he showed that these areas of the brain here in the temporal lobe actually represent uh, musical information in a very abstract way. So what we have here are uh, musical intervals. I don't know if you can hear these, but fairly uh, obvious. This is, that's a minor third, but this is also a minor third. Whereas this might be 
a perfect fourth. So what we have, um, we, we take uh, well-trained musicians, we have them listen to these tones, that's really all they're doing, and we measure uh, brain activity. And then what we do is um, we use a technique where uh, a computer algorithm tries to figure out if the pattern of activity in a given brain area corresponds to a particular feature of the sound. It's called a multivariate classification. I won't bore you with the details. But what we find is that these areas of the auditory system encode not the sounds themselves, but the relationship between the sounds. So this region that I'm showing you here um, is able to distinguish all the minor thirds, whether they're in one key or in another key, from all of the major thirds, from all of the fourths. So it is not encoding the C and the E flat, for example, it's encoding that the C and an E flat make up a relationship which is a minor third. So it's an abstract level of representation without which I would think you can't really have anything like music if your brain is unable to process the relationships between sounds. Um, similarly, um, the brain responds, the auditory region responds not just to the sounds themselves, it does that of course, but it also responds to violations of expected patterns. So if I play for you this silly little tune, you probably noticed there were two strange things that happened in there. And your uh, auditory cortex is active. I don't know if you can really see that. Um, but there's a region of auditory cortex that responds to those expect to those unexpected changes. And what's interesting about that is that um, you haven't heard this melody before, unless you attended one of my lectures. And um, it's, it's one of the compositions that, uh, this is why I, I did not become a musician and I became a scientist. This is the level of my uh, compositional ability. Um, but even though you've never heard it, you know what to expect based upon your abstract knowledge. You've heard many similar kinds of tonal patterns during your life, and so you know what is the right type of sound, what is the wrong kind of sound. I'll come back to that concept later on. Um, the auditory system is also very important for musical imagery, and this is what we define as the ability to evoke music even when it's not uh, present in the physical environment. And of course, uh, we all know Beethoven was uh, quite deaf later in his life. I was just in the uh, Beethoven house in Bonn uh, two days ago, and I saw these gigantic uh, horns that he was trying to use that were actually built for him by uh, Melzel. And of course, they don't work at all. Um, but he was extremely deaf and nevertheless was able to compose remarkable music, and that's because he had an internal um, representation of these, of these sounds. And although we can't scan Beethoven, we can use different types of approaches to uh, look at the brain activity associated with um, musical imagery. And I'm not sure you can see much there. I can't see anything, but um, there are regions here. If you look on the far right, there is an area of auditory cortex shown in orange, which is active when um, people are listening to the music. But in green, just on the edges of the orange area, are the regions, I don't know if you can see that, but these areas here are part of the auditory cortex. These regions not only respond to real sound, they also respond when a person is imagining the sound. So this goes back a little bit to Penfield's experiments in the sense that you've heard a lot of music in your life, you can call it to mind, which means that it must be stored somewhere, and when you evoke it, when you are perceiving it in your mind's ear, quote unquote, the same regions of auditory cortex that were initially active when you first heard it are then reactivated. And this is the mechanism by which we're able to carry around music with us. Now I said that um, the, uh, some of these um, circuits that involve auditory cortex and also the uh, inferior frontal cortex, which I didn't mention, are important for musical perception. The more dorsal pathways are important for a number of different, uh, uh, action, different activities that we can carry out, and they're especially important for mapping sounds to actions. And what I mean by that is that when you play a musical instrument, or when you sing, uh, 
you, of course, are executing an action with your muscles. That action produces a sound, and then the sound influences the action again. So it's a closed loop. It's a feedback loop, which is what is sort of represented in this diagram. So we want to also be able to study how this feedback loop works, how the interaction between the motor system, which is responsible for generating the actions, and the auditory system, which is responsible for monitoring the consequences of those actions, how those two systems work together. And here, this diagram is showing you a, a violinist. We had a very hard time trying to put a violin into the scanner, but we did actually construct um, a cello, which you can put into the scanner. And you see my very talented uh, student, Melanie Sagado, who is a professional cellist by night and a neuroscientist by day. And uh, she's playing this uh, device, which was built for us by uh, some um, music technology uh, engineers uh, at McGill University. And it's a, it's a strange uh, instrument, but it has a very small bow. I don't know if you can see on the top right, there's uh, Melanie inside the scanner. The scanner is very tight. If you've ever been in an MRI scanner, it's a long tube, right? It's very tight. But we have a little tiny bow. We went to a luthier and asked them to make us a bow that was this big, and they looked at us like we were insane, um, which perhaps we were. But we, this thing actually works. You can play, you know, it's limited what you can do with it, but you can, you can play reasonable things. And if you look at this um, brain uh, image on the left here, these green areas represent the areas that are involved um, as um, cellists are playing the instrument and as they are adjusting the movement, the position of their left hand to correct for pitch perturbations. So they play a, t they play a tone with this instrument and then we introduce a change in the pitch and then they have to adjust for it. So this is the loop between hearing and action because when you hear something, if it isn't quite right, you have to immediately adjust for it. And this is what musicians do online all the time when they're um, actively playing, is they're, of course they're actively monitoring and they can adjust very, very, very closely, fine tune their actions so that the um, motor system will produce the exact correct sound. And so we can study this process uh, in the laboratory inside the scanner. And if you notice these regions here in the parietal lobe and the premotor cortex correspond pretty well to what we had uh, already described earlier as the, uh, the dorsal pathway, which is this pathway for uh, auditory motor integration. We can uh, explore uh, some of this, um, these components of the system a little bit more by looking at highly trained musicians. And for this we turn to um, a different brain imaging approach where we measure the brain anatomy. So everything I've shown you until now is brain activity. It's actually the amount of oxygen that's consumed by the, by the neurons. We can also measure brain anatomy with magnetic resonance imaging. And when we looked at this, a study done by Patrick Bermudez in my laboratory, we um, looked at the brains of highly trained musicians versus people who were similar in other respects, but they did not have musical training. And we were able to measure the thickness of the cortex. So how, um, how much the gray matter differs between the two groups is what's illustrated in these diagrams. And what you can see is that the musicians have more, um, have greater thickness of the cortex in the auditory areas, which makes sense because they spend a lot of time listening to music, uh, in the motor cortex, which also makes sense because they have specialization, as we've seen, um, and uh, in portions of the frontal cortex. So this result, we think, uh, and there are other results like it, are indicative of um, how training is able to sort of fine tune the system so that you can achieve um, specialized control over the hands. We um, can furthermore see that these changes in the gray matter are very much dependent on the age at which training starts. This is, this is some work done by uh, Jennifer Bailey in Virginia Penhune's lab. And what um, was done in this study was to look at musicians who are now adults, but they began their training at either when they were quite young, ages four, five, six, or when they were older, ages eight, nine, 10, 11. And this part of the frontal cortex that you see in blue there, if you're able to see it shown here, is um, more highly developed, but only in the people who started training early. That's what this graph shows you. 
So the earlier you start, the more you get this change. And um, this turns out to be important because if you actually test how accurately a person can reproduce um, a temporal pattern, so they hear a rhythm and they have to tap along with it, and we measure how many milliseconds they're off between the intended uh, rhythm and the produced rhythm, we see in the bottom right uh, graph here that those people who have a more highly developed frontal cortex are the ones who are more accurate compared to those that have a less well-developed um, area of the, uh, of the frontal region. So it turns out to be important for um, the uh, accuracy of reproduction. And we see a similar effect in this work um, from uh, Christiel, where the connections between the motor regions between the two hemispheres are also strengthened. So here we're actually looking at the white matter component, which is the um, uh, fiber tract that connects the two gray matter regions of the left and the right hands. And um, that development occurs to a greater extent in individuals whose training be begins more early as compared to those whose training begins later. And by the way, in all these experiments, the total number of years of training was controlled for. So it's not a consequence of the amount of training, it's a consequence of the age of training. So to sum up uh, this uh, part of the, of the lecture, the auditory cortex and all of the uh, connections via these pathways are what I would call the hardware that enables us to encode sounds, the relationships of sounds, to generate uh, expectancies and predictions, and they enable us to uh, retrieve stored representations. This gives us imagery, gives us memory, um, and they're also essential for auditory motor interactions, which is how we're able to produce music. But I said at the beginning of the lecture that uh, music was about emotional uh, arousal and about um, pleasure. And so this doesn't have very much to do with pleasure. So far, I've only talked about the perceptual and motor components, not about pleasure. So we have to ask, what about pleasure? And uh, of course, the ancients uh, knew that music can give you pleasure. This is uh, uh, Ulysses, who's um, tied to the mast, of course, because the singing of uh, the sirens is so pleasurable that who knows what, what would happen if uh, he didn't get, get tied up. And really, uh, the, the aspect of pleasure of music has been recognized for a long time. I have a very interesting quote here from St. Augustine, who wrote in his Confessions the following, I fluctuate between the peril of pleasure and approved wholesomeness, inclined to approve of the usage of singing in the church so that by the delight of the ears, the weaker minds may rise to the feeling of devotion. Yet, when it befalls me to be more moved with a voice than the words sung, I confess to have sinned penally and then had rather not hear music. This is a very insightful comment, I think. He totally understands that music can be so pleasurable that you might end up feeling really good about the music and you might forget all about God. And music is supposed to be, in his view, of course he's writing his confessions, right? So he's confessing all the bad things he did. 33 volumes of confessions, so there was a lot there that he had to discuss. But um, with music, he recognizes the fact that um, instead of being devoted to God, music might actually be able to substitute for God. And a kind of a similar statement is made by a more contemporary uh, figure whom you may recognize. Um, the Ayatollah Khomeini famously said, music corrupts the minds of our youth. There is no difference between music and opium. Both create lethargy in different ways. So he found music extremely dangerous, and of course, famously, the uh, Taliban attempted to uh, ban music in, uh, in Afghanistan when they were in, in control. So why is it that music gives us pleasure? Well, let's try to address that. And we address it first by looking, of course, since we are neuroscientists, we try to look at the brain systems that are involved in pleasure. And these have actually been studied by a number of different people for many, many years, not in the context of music, but in the context of other kinds of um, stimuli. And again, I'm not sure if you can see that. I'm sorry if you can't. But there are a series of structures deep in the brain, uh, known as part of which is known as the striatum, which is the most important structure. And 
this uh, system is very much involved in different aspects of pleasure, reward, motivation, the series of different uh, terms that are used. And if we look at studies that um, try to explore the brain activity associated with pleasurable stimuli, we see that they have something in common. Namely, the striatum is the area that is always responding to different kinds of stimuli. So in this particular um, uh, meta-analysis by uh, Guillaume Sescus, what they identified were studies that use, again, I don't know if you can see it, but the first set of studies use monetary rewards. So these are like gambling sort of studies where you, you get money and that's very pleasurable. Then you have food rewards. So these are experiments where people either see food when they're really hungry or they actually receive a little bit of, uh, of food. And the third one are um, erotic rewards. So these are studies where people are exposed to erotic stimuli. And you know, these, these studies are all very popular, by the way. It's easy to find the participants to uh, sign up for them. What they have in common is that the striatum is always active. Similarly, if we look at studies of drug rewards, so these are studies done by colleagues of mine who've looked at um, the administration of cocaine, amphetamines, or alcohol, you again see the same structures that are involved in the striatum. And not only that, but they involve the molecule dopamine. So dopamine is one of the neurotransmitters, and it's the one that is most closely associated with activity of this system, of the so-called reward system. So a few years ago, we wondered, could music activate the same system? Even though it is not a drug, it is not a substance, there's no chemical uh, behind it, and it is not a survival-related um, activity in the sense that food is, for example, right? So we've done a number of different experiments. I don't really have time to tell you all about them, but here is one that was done um, in my laboratory by Valerie Salampour. And what Valerie was able to demonstrate is that indeed the striatum is active when people are listening to highly pleasurable music, music that gives them chills, that gives them a sort of tingling uh, effect uh, or shivers down the spine, has different uh, descriptions, but most people know what, uh, what that is. And if you compare the activity pattern to, for example, activity associated with drugs, this is from amphetamine, you see that there's some commonality. You can see there on these two uh, images. And uh, this finding um, uh, has, uh, I think, has generated a lot of interest. And actually, um, Professor Kolsch, who's, who's here, uh, has done a lot of very nice uh, work along these lines as well. But we can go a little bit further than that. And this uh, might be a little bit uh, hard to see again. but. What we can do is we can actually look at the time course of the activity in relation to when the peak pleasure occurs. So in these experiments, people bring music that they really enjoy, they bring it to the laboratory, and they listen to it while they're in the scanner, and we ask them to indicate when they feel a chill, when do they feel this maximum pleasure. And then we look at the brain activity prior to that point and after that point. And that's what the graph on the bottom is. And if we look at when the chill occurs, Prior to the chill, for about 10 or 15 seconds, the maximum activity is in the dorsal part of the striatum, so a little bit higher up. Whereas after the chill, the major part of the activity is in the ventral striatum, which is slightly below. And that's what is shown in this graph. The dorsal striatum is most active during this, what we call, anticipatory period. And then at the moment of the peak pleasure, it goes down, and that's exactly when the ventral striatum sort of shoots up. Now, why is this anatomical distinction of interest? Why do we care about that? Well, I think there are two ways in which uh, it turns out to be interesting. If we talk to um, neuroanatomists and we ask them, well, what is the distinction between the dorsal and the ventral stratum, they will tell us that those two subregions are connected to different parts of the brain. So the dorsal stratum is what might be considered the more sort of cognitive part of the reward system because it's connected to areas of the brain like the prefrontal cortex, the cingulate cortex, that are uh, very important for higher order cognitive functions, including things like predictions, um, anticipation, planning, and decision making. So these are the kinds of functions that you might expect to be involved during this so-called anticipatory phase. 
um, when you are hearing something and you're, you know what's coming and you're anticipating it and you're, you're planning ahead, you're thinking ahead. The ventral striatum, on the other hand, is what might be considered the more effective part uh, of the system because it's connected to structures like the amygdala, the ventromedial frontal cortex, and several brainstem nuclei, which have to do much more with emotion and emotion regulation and also um, physiological functions like um, uh, controlling uh, the heart rate, controlling respiration, and so forth. And these chills, by the way, are accompanied by changes in the psychophysiology, so changes in, in respiration and, uh, and heart rate. So that distinction between those two subsystems has, uh, I think, a reasonable basis in the neuro neuroanatomy. But perhaps more interesting for this audience is that the distinction between anticipation and, and uh, uh, experience of pleasure also seems to fit rather well with what music theory tells us. So when I first presented these results to my colleagues in the Faculty of Music uh, at McGill, they said to me, well, yes, but haven't you read Leonard Meyer's 1956 book on emotion and meaning in music, where he argues that emotions in music arise from the fulfillment or the suspension of musical expectations. And this idea has been taken further more recently by David Huron, who's a, a musicologist uh, in the United States. And the idea, which I can only uh, give you a very superficial sense of, is that as you're hearing music, you develop predictions based on expectancies. Those expectancies are, of course, based on your knowledge, based on what you've heard before, on, the entire, um, on your entire listening history, which, as I said before, we're all sort of carrying around with us, in a sense, uh, in our brains. And com composers and performers um, exploit this sort of concept to create tension, sometimes to delay the gratification, and this heightens emotional arousal. So this idea that there is both anticipation and, and uh, reward has a counterpart, at least, um, within um, music theory. There's one last uh, detail I want to mention to you, which is that in the first part of the talk, I, I mentioned the uh, cortical circuitry that's important for, for music perception and production. In the second half, I've talked about the uh, reward system and the striatum, we can actually link these two things together. And this is in a further study carried out by Valerie Salampur. And what we did in this study was we looked at the activity in the reward system in relation to monetary valuation. So I won't go through the details, but essentially listeners were um, perceiving music and they were asked to indicate how much value they would assign to that music by putting a dollar value on it. So it's kind of like what you do when you listen to something on iTunes, you listen to a segment and you say, okay, I want to buy it or I don't want to buy it, and how much money do you want to put? And the more money you are willing to use, in other words, the greater the value is uh, to you, the more activity there is in this region, which is a stratum. But the most important part is that as the value increases, the crosstalk between the stratum and the auditory cortex also increases. So in other words, the what we call functional connectivity, which is the way that the two systems are interacting, is heightened for more valued music than uh, for less valued music. So this brings together the um, reward system with the auditory uh, cortical system. And what I think this means is that you know we have these two different systems. On the left is the, the cortical system, on the right is the um, striatal system. And what I th would like to suggest is that music might be a, uh, a way by which humans have learned to enhance their emotional arousal or to regulate their emotional arousal via the, the interaction of these two systems. On the one hand, this reward, valuation, or um, salience, motivation kind of system goes by a number of names because it has a number of very complex functions. And these are loops that involve the striatum, but also limbic and paralimbic areas, which I have not had a chance to talk about. So that system enters an interaction with the more phylogenetically advanced perceptual and prediction mechanisms, which are, are cortically, ba cortically based. And that reward system is phylogenetically ancient. So we share that system with a lot of other creatures that um, also respond to rewards, of course. But maybe what makes uh, our species particular is that we also have the cortical system that allows us to perceive these relationships and 
generate these expectancies. And when the two systems are acting together, that's when um, the beauty of music happens. So I would like to end there, and uh, I especially want to thank all of my um, research staff and uh, students, postdoctoral fellows, and also many of uh, my colleagues, without whom uh, none of this work could be done. And thank you all very much for your attention.